Good morning and a warm welcome to Worship at St Mary's, either here in church or in wherever and whenever you're enjoying worship. And a special welcome to those gathered at the front of the church to mark and celebrate Mother's Day. Church news. We announced last week the passing of our church member, Margaret Beattie. The funeral service for Margaret will be held this Tuesday, the 12th of March at 9.30 at Hollytown Crematorium and our thoughts and prayers remain with Margaret's family and friends. It is my sad duty to inform you of the death of a great friend and supporter of St Mary's, the Reverend Robert Kent. Bob, who has for many years been a regular preacher at St Mary's, especially during our period of vacancy. And I know Bob greatly appreciated the welcome, support and friendship he received when he visited us here. We were particularly honoured that Bob was able to join us last November for our anniversary service, where he delivered a powerful and memorable sermon, even though he was clearly recovering from a recent period of illness at that time. We give thanks for Bob's time with us. Our thoughts and prayers are not only with Bob's wife, Leslie, family and friends, but also with his church family, friends and colleagues. Following a private funeral service, there will be a service of thanksgiving for the life and service of Bob on Wednesday, the 20th of March at 1pm, and that's to be held in Trinity Church, Lark Hall. I commend this service to you. Can I remind the members of the Men's Fellowship Committee that we are meeting tomorrow at 7.30 here in the church. The congregation are invited to attend the annual stated meeting, which takes place this Wednesday at 7pm in the Avon Hall, and at the conclusion of that meeting, there will be a meeting of the Kirk Session. It is with great pleasure that I inform you of the ordination service for the Reverend Hazel Shaw, taking place in Paisley on Friday evening, the 19th of April. Hazel was a student here a few years ago and has returned many times to visit us. It is our intention to organise a bus to attend this service, so should you wish to attend and travel together, please give your name to Margaret McCloy or myself as soon as possible, as places on the bus are limited and there will be a small charge to cover the cost of the bus. I commend the rest of the intimations contained in the order of service to you. It is again my pleasure to welcome back to our pulpit Isaac McCleary. Isaac, we greatly appreciated your powerful worship the last time you were here and we look very much Look forward very much to sharing with your worship again. Thank you very much. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. And of course, it's Mother's Day. So I'm looking down at this field of flowers here. Do you see what I did there? That's, yeah. So welcome, um, every mother. And we think about all mothers everywhere this morning and we pray God's richest blessing on them now we're going to have our introit the choir is going to sing
Thank you so much. Now, Joanne, Isla, and Ailey, where are you? Oh, there you are. So you will do for us this morning, of course, our call to worship. Thank you so much. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Thank you ever so much. A tremendous psalm. We come to worship our God, to know his presence among us, <clears throat> to know his Holy Spirit ministering into our lives. And we do that as we stand and sing our first hymn this morning. Hymn 449, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Tremendous hymn, of course, by Charles Wesley. I don't know how many of you know of his, uh, his hymns, but they all present in such wonderfully beautiful ways the truth of our faith. They're worth reading, uh, just not just simply for the poetry, but for the truth contained 
in these words. Rejoice, the Lord is King. And so we come into the presence of God, the King, this morning in our prayers. And not only is he the King, but he's also our Father. And we come to him. That makes you prince and princesses, by the way. Does that, does that warm your heart? No? It does mine. Let us pray. And we rejoice this morning, our God, that we have this opportunity to come into your presence through Jesus Christ, your Son. We acknowledge that you are the King of heaven the Lord of lords, that you are seated in, in power and splendor and glory and majesty, that there is none like you, that you radiate holiness. You are altogether different. We want to acknowledge that just now. And to accept our finitude, our creatureliness, our weakness, in the presence of your awesome person. And to accept, God, that we are utterly dependent upon you for all things. And though we recognize your lofty person. We thank you that you do not treat us with disdain. We're not held at arm's length. You did not just simply leave us and walk away when we turned from you. But you came to us in Jesus Christ, seeking those whom you created, seeking those who had no time or interest in you, our God. And in Christ you have redeemed us and restored us and forgiven us. You have made us your children. And so we come this morning to rejoice and to worship and to give our thanks for all that you have done in our lives. For all the gifts and the goodness of your grace that you have lavished upon us in Jesus Christ, we come and we say, thank you, Father. And we recognize our God, our many weaknesses and our failings, and we confess them to you right now. We know we have sinned in the past week. We have done those things that have brought sadness to your heart and you call to us to come back and to receive your forgiveness to receive the cleansing that comes because of the sacrifice of Jesus so we come and we ask for your forgiveness and we receive your forgiveness in faith and ask now that as we know your hand upon us that you would Lead us into worship by your Holy Spirit that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Come. Bless us this morning. Speak into our lives by your Spirit. Encourage us in our faith that we may live and seek to live lives that are pleasing to you. For this our prayer we bring in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, young ones. <clears throat> chronologically young and young at heart and all that kind of thing. Oh, nearly forgot. Now, I was asked if I was bringing my treadmill in my pocket this week, and I thought, no, I better not, because um, I couldn't quite fit the treadmill into my pocket. But I brought something else, right? <clears throat> right, young ones, let me read to you, right, from the scriptures, and it's in John's Gospel, chapter 3, and it says this. How great is the love. Hiya. <laughs> the Father has lavished on us 
that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Did you hear that? To be called children of God. And that is what we are. How many of you spend time with one of these? <laughs> so do I. Brushing my hair every day. <clears throat> Making sure it's nice and straight. The mirror. Do you know what's frightening about this thing, right? And every time I look into it, I see my dad. I see my dad looking back at me. Isn't that crazy? And some of you will know that you've become more and more like your mum. Oh, yeah, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> Right? <clears throat> you become more and more like your mum or your dad. Let's have a show of hands. Ladies, how many of you have become more like your mum? Just one, two. Oh, come on. Right, how many of you become more like your dad? Yeah. You find yourself doing things or sitting or saying the same voice, intonation, everything. And it scares you, right? My dad always sat <laughs> with his ankles crossed. And guess, I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? I find myself I immediately uncross my legs, right? Don't want to be that. <laughs> he had thumbs that were nothing on, like, unlike anything you've ever seen. I mean, they curved. I mean, that. I used to stick lollipop sticks on my thumbs because I didn't want thumbs like my dad, right? <laughs> And I'd go to bed with lollipop sticks on my thumbs to keep them straight. Yeah? And I inherit, you know, quite a bit from him. There's no doubt about it. Uh, this, right? I remember going to a wedding where all my, my uncles, the patriarchs, right? In, my, in, in, in West Indian uh, communities, the older you get, the wiser and the more revered you become, right? So the, the four sages, <laughs> uncles, Sitting at the front, bald as coots, right? And I thought to myself, that, that, that's going to be me. And sure enough, what can I say? We inherit their traits. We reveal and demonstrate some of their qualities and characteristics. And, there's, and it's as if we cannot help it. It's just there. And there's some of them that, you know, we wish we didn't, we hadn't inherited. You know that temper that comes out? Oh my, yeah, you know the one? Or that kind of, um, that s degree of selfishness or that sense of, my daughter said, Dad, you could become a recluse at any point. I said, I know. You know, that, that, my own time, my own space, you know that kind of thing? Some of these we wish we had, it's going to be a short sermon, by the way. Some of these we wish we hadn't actually inherited. The Bible teaches that we are, if we believe in Christ, are children of God. Children. So my question is, to what extent do we reveal the qualities, the nature, the characteristics of Christ in our lives? When I go down to England, they look at me and they say, oh, you're so like your dad. I walk in and oh, I'm sure you've had that. When people see us in our actions and, and they listen to the things we say, do they come to the conclusion? Are they struck by the likeness that we have to Jesus Christ? When they look at us, So the question is, do we display his qualities, his kindness, his goodness, his gentleness, his forgiveness, his love, his acceptance? Is that what people see in our lives on a daily basis or is there something else? So young ones, you're going to be like your mom. Or dad. There is no getting away from it. Genetics just, right? You can't escape it. When we belong to Christ, 
as we get older in the faith, we should be more like him. So go home today. Have a look at your lives. The Bible speaks of the, the word of the scriptures as a mirror. Have a look at your lives and say, in all my time of believing in Christ, have I become more like him? Do people see him in me? We're going to sing, aren't we? Um, Jubilati, I think it's right. I'm going to sing it twice. That's the organist who told me to say that, by the way. So, so blame him, right? So there we are. Thank you. Now, I think this is where the young ones escape. Is that right? Yes. Good. Blessings in your church, junior church. It's my pleasure, you know, from, to go around <coughs> various churches um, preaching. And as you know, in our church at the moment, a national church, there is a, a constant demand for um, folk to lead worship. And I think one of the saddest sounds in a church is the lack of sound from young people. It just... It just breaks my heart. Um, and so, you know, we here are blessed to have these young ones among us, honestly. So, you know, if they scream a bit and shout a bit and carry on a bit and, you know, um, raise their voices a bit, our response should be, thank you, God. Because the silence without them does not bode well for the future so let's encourage them let us pray for them let's pray when they go out to their church that God will speak to them that they'd be encouraged to maintain their contact with him here in St. Mary's or wherever God wants them to be we have a responsibility to pray for these young ones and we're going to pray for them as we bring our prayers uh, just now 
and just, just pray for them before the scripture reading. Father, we want to pray for our young ones. We want to bring them before you. We want to thank you for each one of them. They are precious to you. Make them precious to us. Help us to support them, to encourage them, to be those who witness to the love of Christ in our lives and the love of Christ for them. Give us wisdom how to instruct them. Make us those who are approachable. Make us those who pray for these young ones that you would fill their lives with your grace and enrich them with your person. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have our reading. Um, from Luke chapter 7, verse 33 uh, to 50. For John the Baptist has come, eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Nevertheless, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. A sinful woman forgiven. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And when he went into the Pharisee's house, he reclined to dine. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with his tears, sorry, with her tears, and to dry them with her hair, kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who... And what kind of woman this is, who is touching him, that she is a sinner? Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debts from both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he cancelled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the women, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. God bless to us this reading from his holy word. Thank you so much for doing that reading. We're going to sing again. It's number 549, if you've got your hymn books. <clears throat> and it's, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus.
Amen. Now, see, if you were to attend my funeral, you'd be singing that, right? Because that's the other one that's on my list. What a fabulous, fabulous truth. So we're going to turn to God's word for a few moments together and unpack uh, one or two thoughts from uh, the reading uh, that we heard uh, this morning. But before we do, let's let us pray together. We come, our Father, to your word, and we, we just want to ask that you would um, give us that ability to focus on what's being said. And we want to ask that your Holy Spirit, that he would just open the eyes of our heart that we may see Christ and in seeing him see ourselves and understand that which he calls us to and to be. Amen. So we began in verse 33. Where was our reader? Just to explain, right, why we started at verse 33. So we began at verse 33 because in verse 33 uh, of Luke's uh, gospel, uh, chapter 7, you'll see there that Jesus has been labeled the friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's the label that's been given to him. Now, this wasn't a label that was given to elevate him in the eyes of the general public. Absolutely the opposite. This was to denigrate him, to reduce him in the sight of all who considered themselves holy, set apart, religious, righteous, good. And so this label stuck with him, Jesus, the friend of tax collectors and sinners. And so it makes this invite from this Pharisee even more intriguing because Jesus, as we read in the beginning of the chapter, has returned to Capernaum. Capernaum was the place he moved to from Nazareth. And so Capernaum became his hometown, his base of operation. And there you have this man who belongs to this incredibly powerful group of men called the Pharisees. They were both religiously and politically astute, but also exceedingly influential. They, in fact, were the, the, the intermediaries between the Roman occupiers and the Jewish populace. But more than that, they were the ones who dispensed the law of God. They were the ones who interpreted the law of God for the lives of the people. So everything but everything that touched the lives of the Jewish population came through the filter of these men. You know, how far do you walk on a Sabbath day? What color threads can you use in your garments? What, what fabrics can you mix or not mix? How many stones can you overturn in a day? I mean, 613 of them, incredible rules that bound the people to these men. And this person invites Jesus, the friend of tax collectors and sinners, to his home. Now, why would he do that? And I searched and I couldn't find any real kind of uh, conclusive answer given, but certainly there are lots of kind of suggestions did they see Jesus as a threat they did undoubtedly because that's why they killed him could he turn Jesus to their cause could he use him manipulate him what was the message that he was preaching how different how different was it from that which the Pharisees believed was he a threat could he be an ally and so the best place to discover this is in your home, at a meal. And so they, he invited Jesus, perhaps to get a better understanding of this young man who was so popular. Now, when you invite someone to your home, um, I tend, I think, uh, if it's like us, we, we have a wee room that we put them in. <laughs> we don't feed them, we just put them, no. So, so we, 
a wee room that you invite them to, and it's quite a private thing. Not so here in this story. To attend a meal like this was a very public affair. It was often held outside. I know you can't believe it because we live in Scotland, but, but it was often held outside, and the table would be set, and the guests, depending on the importance assigned to them, would sit in a, in a particular place, um, and they had their own place at the table, and they would recline at table, a Jewish and Roman kind of Idios idiosyncratic thing which the Jews adopted. They would recline at table. And then the local community were invited to come into the garden. And I can never understand this. So they were, they were invited to come into the garden and they could get quite close to the table um, and they could, see, <laughs> they could see what they're eating. Um, but more than that, they could listen in on the conversation. Because only the most influential and erudite men, and it was always men, uh, would be invited to this, this meal. And they would discuss the things of the day, but particularly the things of the scriptures, the things that impacted the daily lives of the oi polloi. And so they would be invited to come along and sit in and say, oh, that looks a nice steak. I can, and they could never afford a steak, right? Never, because they're poor. And these men were by and large, uneducated, the oi polloi, the, the, the ordinary men and women, uneducated. And so they'd come in. Now, while this open banquet was taking place, and Jesus was there, reclining at table, a woman walks in. And that's the reaction you'd have had. What is she Now, the reaction came because of a number of things. Firstly, she's a woman. Secondly, she was crying. She'd walked up behind Jesus and she'd burst into tears. But this woman had a reputation. She, Luke tells us that she was a woman of the town, a euphemism. That she lived a sinful life in the town. She was known in the town. She was a prostitute. And this woman stood at the feet of Jesus, crying great sobs. Not just a, but wow. I mean, it, she was, you're right, she was going for it. And her tears were so prolific that they fell on his feet and she knelt down I think out of embarrassment but also out of love and she she used her hair to to wipe his feet and then she couldn't stop because that's what the verb means she couldn't stop kissing his feet not once but over and over and then she pulled out this alabaster jar of perfume. Notice the eyewitness account there. They could tell you what kind of bottle it was, right? And she cracks it and pours the content of that rich smelling perfume. And Jesus is lying. Of course, he's lying down, right? So she's behind him here. And she pours it on his feet and continues to wipe his feet. That perfume, the scent of that would have filled that entire courtyard. It would have been picked up by the soft evening breeze and it would have been carried out into the local community. It would have just permeated everything. Unmistakable. Now those men who saw this would have been incensed. Now, protocol would have, and etiquette would have, that they wouldn't shout and scream and leap up and leave. But there is no doubt that she had broken every traditional and, and just undermined the traditions of the people. 
a woman allowing her hair to fall free. No woman of any moral worth would do that. And to kiss in public his feet, outrageous, offensive. And such is the love that love becomes something that's offensive. I wonder if you've noticed how often in scripture that love offends people. The demonstration of love offends. Think of the, the lost son and the love of the father that's offensive to the eldest boy. Love is offensive. Now, in the reading, Simon was skeptical. I believe Simon was skeptical of, about who this Jesus was. Now, this incident, that which he had just witnessed, convinced him beyond any doubt that Jesus could neither be a holy man nor a prophet. And there's no way. How do we know this? Well, we don't often, when we read scriptures, get into the mind of the character and hear what they're thinking. Very, very seldom do we get that. Check it out for yourself. But here we do, right? Here we do. And he says to himself, if this man, Jesus, were a prophet, he would know who is touching him. And there is a sexual connotation in the word he used. Who's touching him? And what kind of woman she is. That she is a sinner. Jesus, the friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's what he thought to himself. And then we hear Jesus speaking to him. And he spoke directly to the thoughts that Simon had. How we judge people. How we label people. How we readily put them in a box so that we can discard them. That's what Simon did. And Jesus addressed this. He said to Simon, 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 I have something to tell you. Jesus followed the etiquette of the dinner, of the, of the banquet hall. He didn't just blurt out what he had to say to Simon. He said, Simon, may I, may I, may I say something to you? And Simon said, yes, speak. That's how it was done. Now, when Jesus, wants, when Jesus wants to say something to you and to me, we need to listen carefully. He speaks to us from his word. He speaks into our heart. We need to listen carefully. Because what he has to say is always personal. Always. It's always pertinent. It's always appropriate. It's always revealing of the heart and it's always timeous. It's always, we need to listen. And then Jesus tells this parable of the two debtors. And he tells Simon that there were these two people who had debts which they could not pay. One had a debt that was 10 times larger than the other. And they came to a certain moneylender. Now, I don't know what moneylenders were like in those days, but I suspect they weren't very nice people, right? Because moneylenders today are not very nice people. They do things to you like break your legs, kidnap your dog, all that kind of business. No different then. Human nature remains the same, right? This man had, a, this man had form. This moneylender of whom Jesus spoke, he had form. And they knew it. And Jesus said, he would be the last person. He has this reputation. And he'd be the last person on earth you'd expect to forgive the debt. Just would not happen. But he did. And Jesus said to Simon, now, wh which of these two do you think loved the money lender the most? And Simon said, oh, well, I suppose it would have to be the one who... Um, the one who's forgiven the most. And Jesus said, yeah. 
That is absolutely correct. And then he turned, Jesus turned to the woman and he looks at her. His back's to Simon. And he said to Simon, Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her, Simon? Now, this was not a rhetorical question. You see, this question went straight to the heart of all that was twisted in the life and heart of Simon. This was a question that revealed the true nature of Simon's hypocrisy. Do you see this woman? Of course he didn't see her. She didn't register on his radar. Never. You could not find two people in such close proximity who were nonetheless so far apart, worlds apart. You see, Simon was of the elite class, the elite social class. He was educated. He was wealthy. He was influential. He was respected. He was pious. He was a pillar of the community. That's who Simon was. What's the name of the woman? Did anybody pick her name up in the reading? Did you see her name mentioned? She wasn't even given a name. Not a name. Utterly insignificant. That's who she was. No influence. No education. A figure of scorn and shame. The bearer of a soiled reputation. That's who she was. And even now as Jesus draws Simon's attention to this woman, and indeed everyone in that banquet, as he draws their attention to this woman, Simon could not see her because he had labeled her. Sinner. Embossed it upon her person. He could see no further than that. He was blind to the person who stood or knelt at the feet of Jesus. Someone created in the image of God and loved by him. You see, Jesus looked into her face and he loved her. God the Son saw past her reputation and the labels and all the things that society would have you use as a barrier to keep you away from making contact with this person. You see, seeing someone is not just a passive act. You know, Jesus didn't ask Simon, did you notice this woman? He asked, did you see her? And it's just not semantics. It's not just semantics. It's about being able to make and to bring that person into a relationship with yourself where nothing but nothing prevents you from getting into the life and the the experience and to support and to care for and to minister love to that person, whoever they are. Simon considered himself a righteous man, a God-fearing man, a church goer, well, to be more accurate, a synagogue goer, right? He lived by the law of God, he said, and, and, and he considered himself faultless. And he was, con- he was confident that there was nothing of any real significance in his life that required forgiveness. He was pious, he was upright, he was righteous. And he judged all men and women by that standard, by his standard. And here's the thing. When we set standards for others, we very often fall short of being able to fulfill them ourselves. But we still maintain that that is how others should live. That's Simon. Remember St. Paul, he was of that same group of men, the Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee. And he said this before his conversion. 
Philippians 3, 5 to 8. If someone thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, he says, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. You can't get any better, any higher than that. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. And then after his conversion, he writes, but whatever were gains to me, I consider them garbage that I may know and gain Jesus Christ. So Simon measured himself. How, what standards, what standards do we apply to ourselves? Do you see the man or the woman who come into this church? They're not like us. They may have a different outlook. They may have a different appearance. They may not be, they may not wear the same suit. They may not wear the same, you know, do you, do you get the point? What about the girl that r runs amok with her life? What about the, the man who has, you know, is, is riddled with his habit, whether it's drug or, or, or substance abuse? Do you see that person? Do you see them? If we cannot make space in our church for these people to come in and be seen, where else can they be seen? Are we not the face of Christ? Are we not the face of Christ to these people? If not, why are we here? What's our purpose? I'm going to cut it short, right? Because I know I'm running out of time. You'll get home in time for your lunch, I promise. Right? Five more minutes, and then call it quits. You see, Jesus saw this woman. Oh, we need to see people with the eyes of Christ, with the heart of Christ, with the compassion of Christ. We do. Because there's a world out there that's hurting. It's hurting, it's hurting. There are men and women out there who are lost and just needing someone to look into their eyes and say, I care for you. I care for you. Jesus saw her, saw her heart of love, her love for him. And he saw that it cost her to do and to demonstrate this love in this place. You see, this woman was prepared to walk into the most hostile environment, to face scorn and ridicule and rejection of these influential men. She was publicly and unashamedly willing to demonstrate her love for Jesus Christ. And everything that Simon failed to do for Christ that indicated that Jesus was snubbed by him. He's only here on sufferance. That's what his actions indicated to everyone around that table. He's only here by sufferance. Why? Because his feet weren't washed. He wasn't anointed with oil. He wasn't given the kiss of friendship. These things which were standard etiquette at these meals. Simon refused to give these to Christ. Snubbed him. And in that culture, everyone would have known that. He said, Simon, what you fail to do, she has done. She's outshone you in extending her love for me. You fail to extend the very basic courtesies as required. You didn't even wash my feet, Simon. She did more, a great deal more than that. You see her as the greatest sinner. I see her as the one who loves me most. Here's the truth, right? If we were to actually at some point sit down, I'm going to finish there actually. If we were to sometimes sit down and look at our own hearts, 
because that's what the parable does, you see. It forces you and I to look at ourselves and ask, yeah, how much have I been forg forgiven? I am I one who recognizes the debt that I couldn't pay and, and respond with absolute outrageous love for Christ? Or am I the person who thinks I have very little that needs forgiven, so therefore, you know, I can stand back and, and consider myself okay, thank you. You see, Simon, if you'd have recognized the debt you couldn't pay and that, that God has forgiven you, God has forgiven us in Christ. Do you see how wonderful the parable is? This is about Jesus Christ. This is about him laying down his life so that the debt of sin that we owe and could never pay, he paid it all. Jesus do you remember the old song? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Now, if you can recognize that, I, I guarantee it will change you today. It will change your approach. It will get rid of those labels. It will make your heart tender. It will make you more compassionate. It will bring you into the very life of Christ. And that's why we exist as a church. Now I'm going to stop there, right? Let's pray. We come, Father. Your word, your word always speaks to us. Always challenges us. Always encourages us because we know that in you, because you love us so much, you love us, you love us beyond measure. And you want our lives to reflect your love to those around us. So help us to recognize your gift of love to us. The acceptance, the complete and utter acceptance we find in you. And allow us to spread that abroad liberally to others we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offerings. will be uplifted. Let us pray. Father, we bless you for the opportunity to demonstrate our love for you in this very practical way of giving to you some of that that you've lavished upon us, a token of our love. And we pray that you would use all that we have given and our lives in your service. We come and we pray this morning, our Father, for the families of Margaret and Robert Kent. And we just want to pray 
as your people here, we want to say thank you for all that we have known of them. For the commitment to yourself. Thank you for Robert's ministry among us. That you blessed us through him. Thank you for the hope that we have as Christians. That he is with you in your very presence. Would that hope strengthen his family and his friends? Would they rejoice in their hope? And we pray that too for, for Margaret and her family. That they would know that underneath them and all around them are your arms of love and compassion. Make us those, we pray, who extend your love and your compassion to them in the most practical ways. Father, we pray on for our world where men and women, their lives are devastated by wars. Where children are often so abused by the violence that follows from such conflict, young lives destroyed, minds shattered. We want to pray and pray on that throughout our world where violence and wars, where hate and injustice thrive, that you in your grace, our God, would intervene. So we pray that you'd raise up those who would seek to bring about peace. We pray for those who seek to help and to support so many in need throughout our world. We pray for our land and we would ask that you in your grace would continue to bless us. Thank you for all the, the privileges that we have. For the privilege of meeting together in freedom to worship you. We pray that you would draw men and women across our land into the knowledge and the truth of Christ, that they may know him, know his acceptance, know his love, know his forgiveness and be changed. We pray for our family here in St. Mary's, and we thank you for one another. We thank you for the bond of love that you have created among us. Our prayer is, our Father, that you would deepen our love one for the other. We pray, especially on this day, Mother's Day, for those whose hearts are broken because they have lost their mum, irreplaceable. We pray for those who have become new mothers. Oh, would you just bless them and strengthen them? Would the joy of new life just thrill them? And yes, when they feel tired and worn out, refresh them. Make us people who support. For those of us, our family are in hospital, we pray for them. For those who are in care homes, we lift them before you. Those who are eagerly and nervously awaiting results from various tests, would you calm their mind and allow them to, to, to sink their roots of trust in your grace? And again, we pray for those whose hearts are broken, that you would be their strength and their support. Come then, our Father. And bless us and answer these our prayers as we bring them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bring our service of worship to a close as we sing Meekness and Majesty 3, 6,
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with our hearts this day and forever. Thank you.